when I think about it, there's actually three Eureka moments that have determined where I'm going. The first was in my early history on, on the farm, and it was sitting around uh, the big country porch table at lunch waiting for my grandfather to come in to, to say grace. We'd all been working in the field all morning. We were hot, sweaty, and hungry. We were allowed to fill our plates up before Grandpa came in. And as I was sitting there idly staring at that plate, I realized that I had had a hand in growing every single thing on it, from the fresh new tomatoes to the lettuce to the beef and chicken and all the rest of it. We had big farm lunches. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. I felt utterly almost screwed into the earth. It was as if the, the ground had opened up underneath me and I, I felt in free fall, as if in an elevator shaft and the cable had broken. And I was a 10-year-old, just overwhelmed by this recognition that I had was a product of the planet. In fact, had to work for my own uh, means of subsistence. Uh, that's where I became a human ecologist, and it's actually the beginning of my thinking about something I've developed along the way with some excellent graduate students, the concept of the human ecological footprint. My second eureka moment it came uh, when, or just after I had been challenged by an economist to defend my position that there were human limits to growth and carrying capacity. I'd given a, a public talk in Vancouver on that subject and this individual, a very prominent resource economist, took me aside and said I'd made a fool of myself because economists had long since abolished the concept of limits. Now this was in the mid-70s, just after limits to growth had come out and uh, he introduced me to the literature on trade and then um, substitution of resources through technological innovation and all of that sort of thing. And I have to admit, I wasn't that familiar with it. So I felt like a bit of a fool. Uh, here was a very cogent argument from his point of view, that humans had the capacity to liberate themselves from nature's constraints. And I was a young wet behind the years PhD at the time, so I was a bit chastened. Uh, but a few, maybe two or three years later, I sprung out of bed in the middle of the night with my eureka moment, I guess this had been churning away in the back of my mind for, for all of that time. It shows you how dumb I am, really. But it occurred to me that the economist argument uh, was valid if we took the standard ecologist's definition of carrying capacity, the number of organisms that can live in a particular habitat without destroying the means of their own substance of the, the habitat. If you've, you're trading and if technology is constantly evolving, then you liberate yourself from the constraints of that particular place. But if you turn the ca carrying capacity ratio over, instead of asking how many people can be supported in this area, the question becomes how much area is needed to support this number of people, wherever on earth that area is. So when we're trading for goods, we're actually trading carrying capacity. We're bringing in the productive capacity of some other place to this place. And that enables this place to greatly over exceed its own productive potential. We, we trade something else that we may have in abundance or we trade our intellectual assets. But the point is we're bringing in resources that are produced in nature somewhere else. So I had my key to developing an index of human impact based on the land area or the ecosystem area embodied in those trade flows. And what I found with some very early estimates is that contrary to the economists' argument that we were decoupling or dematerializing, in fact, over a, uh, even the few years that I did this early work, we could see the eco footprint, the human demand was actually increasing. Um, my third eureka moment came when I got a new computer. I had been calling this estimate, something like the, the regional capsule indicator or human impact indicator. And I got a new computer, a colleague came into my office, I happened to be working on the first published paper of ecological footprinting and calling it something else. And he asked me, how do you like your new machine? I said, it's terrific. It has a much smaller footprint on my desk. I'd gone from one of these big flat things to a smaller tower model. This is 1989 or 1990. And immediately, as soon as I said the word it has a smaller footprint, I realized I was writing about the human ecological footprint. So I zipped through that paper, I changed the whatever it was I was calling it at the time to human ecological footprint, and it was that metaphor that I think gave the idea the power to move forward. So three Eureka moments, one at 10 years old, one you know, 15 years later when I was a young PhD, and then a couple of years after that, that well, no, it's a good 15 years later that I finally named it the human ego footprint.